I'm Panada Sessoms. Um, I am um, director of our physical and cognitive operational research environment lab. Um, and today I'm just going to give an overview um, of the Warfighter Performance Lab or the human performance research um, that we do um, at the Naval Health Research Center. Um, and then as we go on, um, Trevor, um, who is our Smartabase lead, um, talked about how we use Smartabase yesterday. Um, so I'm just going to give um, a much more general overview of all the different things that we do and then pass it on to the other, um, some of the other teams um, in our department. So here's our disclaimer. Um, I, um, the views are only um, my own and not of the Navy or the DOD. And that's for all of them, too. <laughs> so um, this is the Naval Health Research Center, or a nice overview of where we're located. Um, the, um, if anyone has been to San Diego, um, we are, I don't know how this works. Um, the airport's right here. And so we're not that far away. We're in Point Loma um, on the, um, the point. And so this is the um, San Diego Bay. So not a bad place if you are ever in the area to come and visit. Um, the majority of our group um, of Naval Health Research Center is located um, right here. And you can see that these are um, old World War II barracks. Um, like I said, most of the command um, is here. And there's about 300 um, people that work here. We're located um, not too far away down the street um, here. It's on the third fleet base um, where the admiral sits um, to um, oversee the third fleet of the Navy, and we have these two buildings, which is part of the warfighter performance. Um, in this building, um, we have our bio-behavioral bio sciences team, um, led by Dr. Mark Taylor. And then we are located in, a lot of the rest of the lab is located here in Building 74. Oops. So I give you that overview because we have this nice little um, top view of what our lab entails. Um, we have a lot of different labs that are co-located um, in this one building, which allows us to do a lot of different research um, with different um, investigators together, um, having one um, participant go through a bunch of different things um, without having to move from building to building. Um, so we'll give some examples of those as we go on. Um, one example is we've used our lab um, with the sleep team um, where we put them um, in our um, virtual reality system right after waking them up. Um, so I'll give a general overview of some of the groups that aren't here. Um, but here we have our um, environmental um, lab, um, which includes a swim flume where people can swim in place and we can do a lot of different physiological measurements on them. Um, sleep and fatigue lab has several different um, sleep labs here as well as um, their offices. Um, we have a functional fitness testing and body composition area in the back here, which um, tends to be a swing space for us to do a lot of other different research. Um, and then um, our MyCare and uh, FICAR lab here. So quick overview of the other labs um, that we're not speaking to today. Um, here's um, a picture of the environmental chamber. Um, what you're seeing on the left-hand side is about a third of the size of the whole um, chamber. Um, recent, not, um, it's, um, not too old, installed in 2010, can go from negative 20 degrees to 130 to 120 degrees um, with uh, up to 95% humidity. Um, we can have radiant heat and uh, wind setting. So they've done a lot of um, um, heat tolerance testing, um, heat injury testing, and testing of um, MOPS gear, um, so um, chemical warfare type um, equipment. Um, here's um, just some slides from our functional movement um, area. Um, so we have a biodex. Um, uh, we do a lot of static and dynamic balance tracking. So here we have our um, protokinetics mat. Um, and the nice thing about a lot of this equipment, or some of it stays in the lab, such as the biodex, but things like the um, protokinetics mat is kind of our quick biomechanics um, measurements that we can take out to the field. So a lot of the equipment that we try and put in are things that we can also bring um, to other commands. We have, uh, we perform functional movement screens and Y balance tests here. Um, we have force plates built in for jumping. And then we have a whole body composition area where we have the bod pod, um, bio de or uh, DEXA, um, and um, there's a specific study looking at taping and redoing the measures for the Navy um, at this time. 
So like I said, um, my lab is a FICOR um, lab. Um, it's a pretty large lab because we are doing physical and cognitive testing. Um, it's um, centered around a virtual reality environment, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, but we uh, run the gamut of physiologists, um, kinesiologists. Um, we have several clinicians, um, whether it be, they be physical therapists um, or psychologists um, for the different studies that we have, um, and some engineers as myself. So our uh, mission for our FICAR team is to enhance warfighting readiness by improving rehab methods for wounded warriors, as well as the resiliency of healthy warfighters. And you can see here, this is our CARN system. It stands for Computer Assisted Rehabilitation Environment. You'll see some videos in a minute. Um, but here we have um, our um, virtual reality system. It's a 180 degree screen, so the person that is on there is immersed in their environment. Um, we have a six degree of freedom motion platform that they stand on um, with a treadmill that's built in. So there are uh, force plates underneath there. We can measure the biomechanics as they're moving, the forces. Um, uh, so we get our kinetics here. And then we have our motion caption cameras that surround the system um, and also allows them to interact um, with the system. That's um, considered a standard Karen. Um, there are four of them in the DOD. Um, we are um, one of the only ones that's just a research facility, so um, we've gone beyond using it just as a rehabilitation tool. So to do that, we've incorporated a lot of other things um, to make it more immersive. Uh, we have our scent system. Um, doesn't look like this, but it's built in where we can program different smells to come out at different times. We have a driving simulator that we can put on the um, platform, and so that uh, we can, the person that's on there can feel the accelerations and decelerations. And you see the uh, software that's built in is a research grade um, driving simulator. So we can actually measure how many um, uh, errors that they're making um, while they're on the system. Uh, we have a shooting simulator that's built in, um, a laser based shooting simulator. Um, and um, we've started moving into, um, besides this large-scale immersive environment, into augmented uh, and virtual reality head-mounted displays. So again, you'll see some of those in the next slides. Um, so that, those are devices that we've um, put in to increase the, immer the immersion of the system. These are things that we put in um, to um, fit, um, objectively measure their performance. Um, we've done a lot of studies in using mobile EEG platforms. So these three systems um, at the top uh, are devices that we've validated in the system. So not only can the person now sit and do, uh, we can look at their brain activity and their performance um, while they're sitting um, at a computer, but now we have them in a walking um, environment doing these different things um, and looking at how uh, brain activity changes. Um, we have an eye tracking system. Um, uh, do, we do muscle activity through surface electromyography, um, and then um, biomechanics testing. So um, not only do we have our motion capture system, our optical system, um, but we're looking a lot into using um, immersion um, measurement units, so IMUs. And again, um, a lot of that is, uh, we have two reasons for doing that. One is um, so that we can start measuring things where optical motion capture doesn't work, such as when we um, are doing load carriage and we can't put markers um, on the body. But the other uh, reason for doing that, again, is so we can take these um, devices and measurements out into the field. Um, same thing with uh, a lot of insole and um, um, shoe sensors that we're trying to test um, to validate those against um, traditional force platforms. So our team um, manages about 50% um, clinically focused efforts, and then the other half is operational. Um, these are uh, some different areas that we um, are testing in. So um, load care, um, sorry, limb salvage and amputation, um, orthopedic rehab, um, and a lot of our portfolio is um, in traumatic brain injury and vestibular um, deficits, and treating that, assessing and treating that, and then um, also looking to post-traumatic stress therapies. So this is an example of one of the um, studies that we've done for our, our amputee population. You can see we have a bilateral amputee, measure the biomechanics, 
um, in a, a pre-assessment um, where they come in and we have a special treadmill and we trip them. We look at their ability to recover. They do two weeks of therapy um, at the hospital with a special training, 20-minute, um, um, six-session training. And then they come back here afterwards and we do our post-assessment. And the, um, this is the same perturbation that we gave him the first time. So um, he learns how to um, be comfortable with his prosthetic device um, and how um, to react in case of a fall, a potential fall. And the nice thing about this is that we've shown that they come back three and six months later without any training, that they're able to recover in the same way. And um, we've also shown less falls in the community from this. So this is being transitioned to the hospitals um, like Walter Reed and Center for Intrepid. Um, as I mentioned before, a large part of our portfolio is treatment of traumatic brain injury. So we've created several different applications for um, treating patients with this, um, traumatic brain injury who have vestibular issues, so balance issues um, related to their inability to balance or um, because of the visual flow. So we put that all in here. You can see the platforms moving. Um, they're being challenged to, um, they have markers on their hands where they're being challenged to move outside their base of support. Um, and then there's also cognitive challenges that we add to the, um, to the application. And you see the um, here, um, platform perturbations, stroop test, um, they have to turn their head. Um, we're giving all these things. Um, this is some of our initial work and we've um, created more of these specialized um, scenarios that um, treat specifically the, um, the issues that each person has. We see we've, we uh, tend to create this in our scenarios in-house. Um, so this is one we've created um, where the person has to decide um, they're walking. Um, there's a lot of visual um, flow, and they have to decide if they should shoot or not shoot. And see, um, over time, we can increase the task difficulty. So on the left, this is one of the basic um, levels that they start with. Um, they have to balance because that platform is moving around um, with the waves and they have to um, shoot at those targets. Um, but as they get more comfortable with it, we increase that motion platform, we increase um, the difficulty of that visual flow and, and the difficulty level of what they have to do. So, um, we use this for um, treatment of traumatic brain injury, but one of the things that we are looking into um, is using it as a, an assessment tool. Um, the Defense Veterans Brain Injury Center has created this computer-based uh, tool um, called Fusion, and um, it's just a tablet-based test. So one of the things that we're working with them um, is to create a um, more operational version of it um, in the Karen, and so they have to decide if they should, um, they're shooting different targets, but it's more based in this um, fusion um, test that they've validated. Um, and then as part of the whole rehab um, research, um, specific for um, TBI folks, we're creating these um, SmartaBase um, tools so that we can um, acquire the research data um, from them. So you can see on the left and up here, we have a couple different um, questionnaires that um, we're asking the patients to fill out. And then over here is kind of our therapist or research, uh, researcher portal where we can see how many people um, have, are in the study, um, where they're at in the study, and what other um, questionnaires need to be um, done for them. So we're in the initial stages of that. Um, hopefully this portion of the study will start soon. Um, the nice thing about this is that we are working, um, it's a collaborative study um, with an East Coast group um, at, near Walter Reed. And so we've, we're creating this portal so that we have the same tools that we're measuring from. Typically we do paper, um, so moving it over to this portal where we're measuring all the same way and being able to see how many have they consented over there versus over here. Um, it hopefully will be a really nice tool for us. Um, here are some examples of how we're using EEG. So 
Um, we are using them for objective real-time assessment of people going through um, therapy, as well as determining if there are differences between um, patients with uh, traumatic brain injury um, and healthy controls. We're also working on brain-computer interfaces. So um, it's going to be a closed-loop system where um, the load, the cognitive load, is actually affecting um, the application that they're seeing in there. And then our other half of our portfolio is our operational efforts, um, where we're looking at protective, um, personal protective equipment, um, how uh, PPE design affects um, their ability to perform, um, and then things um, like the effectiveness of simulated training and uh, fatigue measurement. So here's just an example of the um, tests that we've run for um, measuring effects of PPE. Um, we're looking at the biomechanical effects of PPE, and you can see we've incorporated different things. Like right here, um, we trip him, and we look at his ability to recover from that potential fall. Um, so we were measuring the biomechanics, their shooting performance, um, other physiological measurements such as heart rate and muscle activity, um, and then also subjective comfort. And that's translated to our survivability testing, where we're actually creating um, a set of tasks that we're validating to determine if they are effective at measuring differences in different types of PPE. So um, in the lab, you're able to determine how much, um, how protective that personal protective equipment is, but not what the uh, performance effects are um, of the, of the um, participants. So we've created set, um, relevant tasks that they can do in the lab that hopefully won't take very long. So when new gear is created, we can run them through and look at how that affects their performance. And then the last thing I want to talk about is um, our work on virtual reality. So as I mentioned before, we're moving um, the, the Karen system is a really nice lab-based environment where it's repeatable, it's safe, um, it's immersive, and we can get to this operational um, testing before fielding it. Um, but that's not um, great for moving technology out. So we're moving to these head-mounted displays, as you can see on the left-hand side. Um, and that could be taken off the Karen um, in the future. Um, but one of the things we're looking at is, can we create these um, immersive environments that um, simulate training? So they could actually be in the VR space, um, any other practice or train in there prior to them going out to the field. So in this case, we've created, um, you can see here, this is um, the IIT, so the Infantry Immersion Trainer. That's at Camp Pendleton. Um, we've recreated that in a head-mounted display so that they can go through it in VR space, um, potentially prior to going out to the IIT, and then also before um, they go out to the real um, field. So you can see here, this is the virtual, this is what an overview of the um, scene that the person is seeing. Um, they see it in space, the treadmill moves with them so they can actually walk through the system. And what we've created in here are um, um, objective measures of their performance. So have they, are they able to see the things that they're supposed to look for, such as um, IED markers? Um, how fast does it take um, to get them through from point A to point B? And we might change that up. Uh, Dr. Markwald will talk about that more. Um, and just trying to get all these um, measures um, that we can in the lab before they actually um, go out into the field. Um, so um, this is like a nice overview of how we fit into warfighter performance. Um, there's a design and simulation phase, and we can test in our lab. Um, and then before, um, get a few people, do a, um, a lot of measurements on there, and then um, change things up before we start fielding on a larger population. So I am a sleep researcher, and I believe that I'm authentic and real, but I really wanted to ask David Martin. <laughs> Do I fit the bill of a sleep researcher? I, I, I totally believe you. Okay, am I pale enough? Because we don't get a lot of sun. Um, so my background, I was an exercise physiologist for a few years, and then I started dabbling in sleep and fatigue, and I got hooked. 
And then I sort of transitioned over into sleep and fatigue research. I've been at the Naval Health Research Center for about eight years, and I now direct a program there that's conveniently, appropriately focused on sleep and fatigue research. Our mission statement, I think, is rather straightforward. Um, methods and strategies for enhancing sleep. Right? We care about managing fatigue and improving performance and endurance. And that is exactly what we do. We have two general lines of funding. Uh, we do have some clinical work. I'm not going to really talk about that today. Uh, I'm mostly going to focus on what we're doing on the operational side because I want to talk about our capabilities, but I also want to share some research findings from a laboratory study that we're just wrapping up, and this is a sleep device evaluation study where we went through about, I think, 12 consumer off-the-shelf devices. We want to see how well that these devices are tracking sleep. And can we rely on these types of devices? Can all of us rely on these types of devices? I mean, they're just popping up every day. There's all kinds of them available. I think most of us agree that sleep is an important thing that we should be tracking. Am I right? Show of hands, hopefully. See, some hands are not going up. I don't know. I'm going to have to talk later. <laughs> What's that? They're sleeping. <laughs> um, so that's an area that we focus on a lot in my lab, is evaluating these types of technologies. You really want to provide guidance to others on what tools are valid and reliable and in what context. And I should also say that validation is a process. It's not one study, right? So we're doing this across multiple studies, but we're just wrapping up our first initial study. And then, importantly, once we have these tools, we can start to link sleep, and in particular, insufficient sleep, sleep loss with human performance, because we know that how you sleep, how long you sleep matters in how we perform. And lastly, as I mentioned, we're interested in these different types of technologies that purport to enhance sleep or sleep stages, sleep architecture. And so just briefly, we do have lab capabilities. We have a two-bedroom sleep laboratory. It's equipped with our gold standard measurement, which is called polysomnography. This is what David Martin was talking about. These are all the crazy sensors right, that we place on the scalp, the surface of the scalp, the face, and the body. This makes us real and authentic, I believe. And it's also the way that we get the most highly precise um, high-value information on sleep and how you're sleeping. But it's also <laughs> directly prohibiting you from getting good sleep because you're wearing all these different sensors and they're all wired together. And then those wires, as you can see, are sort of brought in the back and sort of tied and connected to your shirt. So it doesn't really allow for the greatest sleep. And the, the thing that is most prohibitive is you really can't take it into the field. So it's really a laboratory and it's a clinic-based assessment. Man, it would be awesome to have this type of information in the field, but it's very difficult. Uh, otherwise, we do a lot of laboratory experiments where we're looking at cognitive performance and how that fluctuates under different conditions of fatigue. We have some sound attenuation rooms where if we're looking at studies where we want to isolate people, we'll put those folks in that sound, a sound attenuation booth, which we also lovingly call the box. But I wanted to describe one particular study, just really briefly as an example or a flavor of what we do. And this particular study is looking at a community of folks who basically scan the ocean bottom for threats. So they're looking for mines. And the way this works is, so these, these are the folks that are sort of embedded with explosive ordnance demolition. And so what they'll do is they'll go deploy the drone and then the drone does its thing, right? It scans a predetermined grid, and then they recapture that drone, they go back to the shore, and then they comb through all this sonar imagery data for potentially hours at a time. And what we know about sleep loss and fatigue is that tasks that are very monotonous in nature and that rely on sustaining attention and vigilance are especially vulnerable to performance de degradation during sleep loss. And so this task fits that bill. And so what we're doing for that community who's asked us for guidance on how they can safely uh, perform this task in operational 
uh, situations is provide them guidance under varying levels of fatigue. So we're going to put them through a sleep deprivation study. But the study I wanted to focus on the most is our Office of Naval Research funded study. And this is the study I mentioned just a second ago where we evaluated a lot of these different consumer technology devices. So we had two phases, um, simply because you can't do all the devices at one time. We had to break them into two phases or two cycles. I will say that these are mainly considered next generation devices. So these are not like your Jawbone Up or your Fitbit Flex. But these devices generally have more sensors on board, and the algorithms are using more information in estimating sleep and wake. So we are looking to these devices to essentially replace this technique, OK? This technique is what's been used in the sleep medicine field for over three decades. And it's a technique called actigraphy. And many of you may have heard of actigraphy. These devices cost about $1,000. This is an example of one here. But basically, you would give someone an actigraph. It's an accelerometer. And the algorithm is using information from activity to make estimations based off of sleep versus wake. Estimations whether you're asleep or awake. And what you also need is a sleep log. So you need to also capture information on when people are going to bed and waking up in order for this technique to really, truly be accurate. And so you need the accelerometer and you need a sleep log. And then the clinician or the researcher would take that information, take that watch, download that data, and then look at these actograms. And then we would look at those sleep logs to help determine where we, as a researcher or a clinician, place the rest interval. And then that directs the algorithm. And then these are the type of metrics that you get out of it. Time asleep, time awake, sleep efficiency. Sleep efficiency is basically how much you're sleeping relative to the opportunity that you had. And then things like how long it took you to fall asleep. OK, so 34 people spent three nights in our lab at NHRC three nights each for 102 nights total. And what we did was on one particular occasion, we actually fragmented their sleep intentionally. And that was not to just be exceptionally cruel, but because we wanted to cause a poor night of sleep. And that's because we want to know if these devices are going to be able to pick up on a poor night of sleep. And historically, actigraphy, that's our research standard, has not done a great job at picking up wake when it occurs during sleep. And that's really important because we know that beyond duration of sleep, quality of sleep matters to performance. So we really wanted to challenge these algorithms. And basically, all of our devices, including our research standard device, were compared with polysomnography in this study. I won't go into too much detail. I just want to point out we ran an epic by epic level analysis. And so what we're doing with an epic by epic level analysis is we're comparing each 30 second period of time with polysomnography. OK, and then sensitivity is just the number of correctly identified epics of sleep. And specificity is just the number of correctly identified epics of wake. At the very top on the right, 36.4. That's our research standard. That's the number to beat, OK? And that's what we expect, because this technique, as I mentioned, doesn't pick up wake very well when it occurs during sleep. And what you can see is that two devices right away didn't make that threshold. They didn't make that cut. And so we did not push them forward for further examination. OK, I wanted to show you what a hypnogram looks like. Because if you're picking up, say, a Whoop, or you're picking up an Aura device, or you're picking up a Garmin, or whatever it is that's out there that you're grabbing, and you're interested in collecting that sleep data from, you want to understand how well is that thing actually working, right? And I think this is a great visual depiction of how these things track with our gold standard. So on the left, we have an undisrupted night of sleep. On the right, we have a disrupted night of sleep. That's when we intentionally woke people up by playing tones all night. 
The blue is sleep, the red is wake. And so you can see there's far more wake in this disrupted night of sleep. And what happened? Well, these two devices basically missed all that wake. So that's a poor quality night of sleep that was not picked up by those devices. So if there's an impact on, that, of, uh, on performance of that poor quality night of sleep, we wouldn't know. Okay, or at least we couldn't predict it from the information. And these two devices, and I haven't named what these devices are yet because this is from our second round of testing and we're not quite through that analysis yet, but these were two wrist warns. This was actually another wrist worn device and this was a ring-like device. <laughs> right, okay. So these two did not do well. These two did actually quite well. They picked up on some of those awakenings. Um, so I would feel more confident with using these two devices. Whoop. This is just to show you sleep stages. Some of these devices purport to offer sleep stages. Again, more red on the right indicates more wake. That's that disrupted night. And this is just to give you another sense. Obviously, you want the pattern on the top to match with the device's pattern as much as possible. And what we can see is that this blue is deep sleep here. Top is PSG, that's the truth, ground truth. And you can see this, these two devices missed quite a bit of deep sleep. And this device down here tracked much better but actually overestimated a little bit of deep sleep. I just wanted to finish by quickly saying once we find these tools, we're really trying to move out into the field more and more. Uh, we needed tools that we feel or we felt are valid and reliable first. Um, and so this process for us just looks like, you know, absolute chaos when we're getting ready to go out to flying everything out or shipping it out and then setting it all up. So definitely a cumbersome process. And this is from a course that was conducted at Quantico recently. This is with our collaborator from West Virginia University, Dr. Andrew Thompson. Um, what we're trying to do here is connect sleep with performance, right? The way that we're trying to do that is we're really starting to rely on Smartabase as a way to integrate all that information. And these were some surveys that, again, our collaborators at West Virginia University are also on the effort created for us at that exercise. And so this is really where we're moving. And I just wanted to leave you with, not only do these devices need to be evaluated for their validity and their reliability and their performance, but also, you know, how rugged are they? How practical are they? And so we took that ring-like device, right, we brought it out with us to Quantico just to see how it would do in that environment. It did quite well. We did have some missing data, but we're working on that. And I wanted to just summarize all that by saying this is kind of where we're going. All right. So I work for the A team, uh, stands for Applied Translational Exercise and Metabolic Physiology team. Don't try to say that 10 times fast. Um, we, our mission is to conduct operationally relevant research out in the field that directly affects the warfighter. Um, and to do this, to improve performance, enhance sustainment, and mitigate injury. What we really try to focus on is that, how that physiology mechanism underpins performance, because at the end of the day, performance is what ultimately matters. Um, we do this through three main focuses. One is to adapt those traditional laboratory practices and bring that out to the operator in as natural of a setting as we can. Um, once we kind of synthesize results, then we move forward, report those findings back to leadership, back to the operator to help build buy-in, give them the educational bit, and then lastly, put it out into the scientific body. So these are kind of our capabilities. Um, we really try to strive, all being under the A team or the NHRC umbrella, to build relationships with people that are in the lab to really get the, those highly validated or as close to validated, uh, highest validation methods as we can, like that device three or was it device four? I don't know. Um, so we do undersea medicine, extreme environment, cold, deep, um, diving, thermal regulation, uh, core, core temperature, skin temperatures, trying to prevent 
uh, non-freezing cold injuries, et cetera. A lot of hormone evaluation, cortisol, testosterone, alpha amylase, you name it. Um, there's gonna be this, this overall stress underpinning a lot of our projects. Tactical stress resiliency, again, that's kind of hitting on the project that Rachel was just talking about at Quantico. Measuring caloric expender measurements, kind of trying to give that feedback back to the operator, back to the nutritionist for um, nutritional needs dependent on different training evolutions, et cetera. Performance, evalu a physical performance evaluation. So how does that CFT or PFT really hold up? Is it really an evaluation method that we should be used moving forward? The gunfighter gym shooting platform which is kind of like a Karen system with all the fat cut off. Um, there's no treadmill, there's, you're not in a moving environment, but you have a compressed gun system using uh, shooting, trying to get at some of those cognitive domains and potential deficiencies. Physical standard validations, some projects we did in the past is how can we adapt some of those current um, assessments and validations and adapt them to the female operator. Um, cognitive function assessment kind of dabbling in the cognitive mode and how does training affect your cognitive function and then musculoskeletal injury prevention through the assessment of different PPE systems. How we really try to shift and focus our research is one, first establish that operational gap. This is gonna be done by talking directly to leadership, by also talking to that, op that physical operator um, on, a, on a more minute level and then taking our previous research and uh, figuring out what, what gap we are currently trying to fill. From there, create a research project um, from reading the literature, setting it up, taking all those lab techniques, like I said previously, directly into the field. I mean, we've pulled blood on the docks, we pulled spit samples out on gun ranges, um, to then really bring all that information back to the, to the lab um, and figure out what's actually going on in the field. Are these concepts and are these theories that are developed in the lab hold up in a more ecological valid environment? And then beyond that, take our information and give it directly back to the leadership and to the operators to hope, hopefully drive change. These are our current research lines. There's gonna be a lot of overlap kind of from our capabilities, but just looking at that undersea human performance, comparing and contrasting that to that, that cold deep dive to that cold altitude. How is that? What are the similarities? What are the differences? Cold water metabolism and how is thermoregulation interplaying with that? Androgen's performance and sustainment is a project that is looking at that eight month ELT cycle. How is there certain physiology mechanism undulating throughout? And then again, how, is, how are those changes driving performance? The cognitive marksmanship assessment is using that gunfighter gym or conflict kinetic system to try to pin down cognitive deficiencies. And can we use that as a training tool to then accelerate training through the uh, operator pipeline? And then beyond that, can we also detect neurocognitive changes with subconcussive blast exposure um, beyond that, that typical TBI um, assessment? Moving more, so instead of looking at some of our uh, results, I'm actually gonna more focus on the, the Smartabase aspect and how we're leveraging Smartabase with our research because a lot of the talks that I tend about Smartabase is more of that day-to-day -day monitoring system and we've actually kind of flipped the paradigm and use it as a more of a, a data warehouse. Um, and instead of looking at it periodically, we just data dump at the end of our research study and then use that as a way to kind of pick out results. Um, data sources, we're doing blood, saliva, urine, Garmin, Oura Ring, and Polar. Um, we're also putting our VitaSense, so that's gonna be our core temperature through core pills and skin temperatures through patches. We're also using Forstex, the Dana, um, and then that CMA I was talking about earlier. And then lastly, tablet-based questionnaires. We get all of our data in through three ways. One is API, the next is direct, and then lastly, the most of our data is gonna be that, that CSV upload, mainly because from like an ELISA standpoint, um, everything is just, it's just easier to print it out as a CSV and then push it all at once. I think what Smartabase does best from our perspective is that, that reporting piece. Um, it's so easy to build a dashboard and then just automate, automatically create those reports. 
and we do that to the individual and leadership. From the individual perspective, it really allows us to compare that individual to their direct platoon or task unit, and then further up to their, their team or group, and kind of helps them see where they're, where they're stacking up against everyone else. And then again, build in that educational piece of more of the physiology that we're, we're studying, and we're sticking them eight, nine, 10 times out over the course of eight months. So what are, they're always curious, like, what are you actually finding from this blood or what, why does this even matter? So then really seeing how their training is affecting um, those mechanisms. And then from a leadership standpoint, kind of taking more of that macro view and comparing, we build up this filter system, which then allows you to compare from the group level all the way down to a single operator in any configuration that you want. This is really nice. So from the research perspective, you don't have to have one guy saying, hey, I want to see this, this comparison. Can you, or your statistician or whatever, can you build me this graph? They can go in, see whatever they want. Um, from a, a group dynamic standpoint, everything's color coded and it's straightforward. So then from this, from this filter system, you then we have this giant report that they can go into every metric that we, will, that we look at and then see the comparison to whatever group structure that they set up. Thank you.